Good afternoon, folks. Just to let you know that we're recording this as usual as part of our digital dispatches. Um, Caroline is our guest speaker today, um, here to talk to us about cyber. Um, we will be um, publishing this on our YouTube site, so anybody that couldn't make it today, um, they can pick it up later. So please feel free to share um, with colleagues that uh, maybe don't find this a convenient slot once a month. Um, I, for one, have been very good and done my cyber training this week. Um, it is Cyber Awareness um, Week, I think, or month maybe. Um, so at least I can come on here and not have to hang my head in shame in front of Caroline. Um, so I think it's a very opportune time. We've been having lots of um, news articles and radio items um, about what's been going on. Um, in other parts of um, Northern Ireland. So um, it'll be interesting to hear from Caroline exactly um, what we're doing to protect ourselves. We will take questions throughout. So if you want to raise a hand or put a question in the chat, um, we'll get to those as they come through. Okay, Caroline, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Linda. Um, firstly, thanks very much for everybody who's who's actually come online um, Friday afternoon. Um, this slot, I think everybody's looking to, to wind down in, in the week. Um, what I want to talk about today is cyber in general. Okay, cyber, we could talk for, for, for days on end on all different areas in cyber because it cuts across everything, everything that we do um, across health. I mean, everything that we look at now is we're moving to digital, we're in the digital age and, and what we're doing. Um, whenever we we look at, at the systems, the applications, the, the information we hold, and that's just within the the the, the patient side, uh, we look at the clinical side, we look at the states, I mean you don't walk into the new building now with the lights coming on automatically, everything connects to the network, connects to the internet in some way. Um, so what I want to talk about today is a little bit about cyber, what it is that we're trying to protect, what our, our risks and threats are and what we what we see coming and we have a couple of examples in there, um, notably the, the HSE um, in the south uh, in May last year. Um, we'll give talk about some examples. We'll talk about a bit about the program and what in health we're trying to do to combat this and to stay on top of, of our cyber um, responsibilities. Um, and then we'll talk about what we can all do together as a collective, both. And as we're going through this, what I ask people to do is think about both, not just this being through work and what you do with regards to cyber in your own workplace, but also your personal life. I mean, everything you do now in your own personal life, it's between your, your phones, your iPads, you probably have technologies in your own home everything that connects back to the internet there's risks and challenges there so thinking about that uh, as we move through all of this um, and then probably finally which I, before we start one of the things i say to everybody is you know cyber is everybody's responsibility this isn't back to your it departments or back to our technical leads it's we all have a part to play in order to protect the organization protect ourselves and protect our data so let me just start our presentation here So can you see that okay, digital dispatches? Can do, that's great, okay. So firstly, what we'll talk about, a definition around digital dispatch, around um, cybersecurity, what is it? So it's the protection of devices, services, and networks, and the information we, that we hold. Um, and we talk about it, Paul had mentioned there, I hadn't seen them in a while, we, we actually did a training session this morning with board members, um, and the information we hold it is discussed as crown jewels that you know that that, that is um the data the crown jewels that we have that belong to the hsc belong to our patients and clients that we must protect them from theft damage by electronic means okay as i mentioned earlier there i mean everything we do now is digital we shop online we work we play playstation xbox everything that we do is online um, and we must make sure that we protect ourselves in every way that we can so what do we need to protect and why do we need to protect our information? OK, in order to operate effectively, we need to keep our business data confidential, maintain its accuracy and make sure it's available to use when we need it okay, at, at all times. 
We have legal, regulatory and corporate obligations to protect the information that we, we are responsible for. Um, and there's a number of those, I mean, we, under GDPR, which everybody's aware of, we'll have all completed the training. Um, but there's also a new directive that came out back um, in 2018 is also called the NIS directive and it's the Network and Information Systems Directive. And that is our responsibility to ensure that our network and information systems are protected, are resilient, um, and the information that we hold on those. That is a, an EU directive and is a requirement across all trusts that we adhere to that. Um, we know data breaches are becoming more and more commonplace. Um, I mean, I would deal with those on a daily basis not within the, not not from from ourselves uh, particularly but certainly across our suppliers our partner organizations there's probably another day go, goes by that if you you googled you know cyber attack in the uk there'll be yet another organization um, that has been compromised um, we talk about we'll talk about this later but malware phishing spam ransomware any of those types of attacks are now big business and we talk about the type of threat actors later but the reason they are a big business, you know, that, that this is a lot of this is about money and how much our information can actually fetch, fetch on the black market. And um, the numbers of attacks are increasing due to the success rate, uh, and that that is very very true. We're seeing attacks, as I mentioned, occurring more and more regularly. And um, we're seeing those happening, and we're maybe hearing about those, but not necessarily being publicised because some of the bigger organisations are being attacked. Um, and they don't want to publicise that, you know, that, that will, will be detrimental to their own business. Um, but that information is coming out and we're starting to see some of those. Um, one of the key things, and we'll talk about this throughout this, is around our business continuity, you know, and how we minimise the impact of a, a cyber incident or a security incident. OK, and that, that is key. When we talk about the HSE, we'll talk about the business impact that had. If we have a cyber attack and it takes lots of our systems offline, how do we continue to deliver health services out to our patients and clients when you don't have access to that digital information? You know, and this is back to pen and paper, believe it or not. So it's making sure that we are prepared in the event of a cyber incident that we can still to deliver, albeit a reduced service, but still deliver a, a um, health service out to our patients and clients. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, it is everybody's responsibility. It doesn't matter who we are, we all have a responsibility to ensure um, our cyber controls um, are in place. So what do I need to know about cybersecurity? And we'll touch on this about around some of the common myths um, around cybersecurity and, and where the responsibilities sit. And it's understanding um, why some of these myths are incorrect. Um, and to help you understand some of the key aspects of cybersecurity. So cyber, the myth being it is complex um, and you wouldn't understand it. Um, and in reality, it's not. You don't need to be a technical expert to understand um, what cybersecurity is and to make informed decisions. And an example of that would be, for example, most of us are using WhatsApp. OK, and we know with WhatsApp, you, you, you log in first time around and then it's available on your phone. One of the options available in WhatsApp is two factor authentication. So that requires you every so often to put in a, a pin of your choice to allow you access onto the app again to verify who you are because you're the person that knows what that pin number is. You know, so in our day to day uh, personal lives, we can implement some of these cyber controls on our own devices, in our own homes, in our own home networks um, in order to protect ourselves. And then that will relate back to some of the work that you're both you're doing within your own organizations. The second myth is around cyber attacks are sophisticated. You know, we can't do anything to stop them. And in reality, as I mentioned, you know, this is everybody's responsibility for cyber. We can take steps and we take small steps, which will help reduce the risk. And some of those steps are, if you'd already touched on Linda, is about doing your training, you know, making ourselves aware of what those risks are, making ourselves aware of what some of the potential attacks would look like, knowing not to click on that email or what we're going to do about that. So we all we all have a part to play no matter how small it is and then the third myth is ryan where cyber attacks are targeted you know we're not at risk and um, that's not necessarily true anymore in the sense of health previously probably about three or four years ago ncsc who as you can see on these slides are are, are one of our, our guiding partners and um, that we work very closely with and they would have said that health wouldn't have been a organization that would see or, or, or be targeted by um, criminal gangs or by, by uh, nation states. And what we're saying is it, certainly whenever we would look back on the Ukraine and Russia 
um, conflict that we're seeing, that there is a likelihood of more and more targeted attacks towards health. Um, and that being the case then that we need to, we do need to um, step up our game and be, be more aware of those. Now, thankfully with the Ukraine-Russia um, conflict, we were concerned at the start that we would have seen targeted attacks at, at ourselves. NCSC have confirmed that they haven't seen anything to, to date, um, which is good and does allay some fear, but doesn't allow us to sit back and relax. We still need to move forward with our, our, our cyber controls. Okay, so who are our threats or what are our threats, you know, so, and you'll be aware of some of these, again, I've just touched on Russia and Ukraine, and um, they're certainly from Russian uh, state actors, and um, there had been new, there has been numerous um, cyber attacks on Ukraine and Ukraine's um, infrastructure and organizations, um, and they have been widely publicized right across the world. We know there's lots of cyber criminals out there and they're coming from all over the world and we're seeing that and for them this is around financial gain what is it they can get can they steal our data and i have a slide on that it's exactly how much our data is worth um, and it's all for them it's all about making the money stealing the data and make money from it we then have our hacktivists our opportunists and these are people who just like the hacking like to see how far they can get let's they have some knowledge and see what, what, what they can break into. Um, we did have a, 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 an incident ourselves roughly about two years ago, and it would have been a, an opportunist who was just scanning the network, looking to see where they could, they could um, where there's a vulnerability that they could exploit, uh, and that's what happened. And then probably the, the most important one for us here is the human vigilance piece around this. You know, we all play a part in this. You know, our human error is is one of our weakest links. You know, the final slide there says, you know, majority of data breaches and many cyber attacks can be prevented by humans. Okay, so it's an understanding that we adhere to the security controls that we follow due process that we do our training. We all have a part to play in that. Okay. So what do some of these threats look like? And th this just touches on some of the things, certainly some of the things that we're seeing um, highlighted at, at this moment. So phishing, um, and I'll, I'll talk about phishing in the next slide, but phishing, um, we're seeing lots of phishing attacks. Um, we stop lots of phishing attacks on a daily basis. Um, our, our email filtering service right across the HSE is very good. But I mean, we get hundreds of thousands of emails every day. Not every single one of those makes it to the desktop. I mean, about 80, 85% of those are disposed at the gateway. Okay. We see those phishing attacks um, coming, coming in their thousands on a daily basis. Insider activity. Um, and, you know, thankfully to date, we've been we haven't been susceptible to this. Not to, that's not to say that it doesn't happen. Uh, um, but certainly, you would see that um, in the bigger businesses area, and where there's potential um, for some type of financial gain and so forth, you would see that type of activity. The description of services, um, and that's where we would see um, us being compromised and being flooded with with um, different elements in order to try and disrupt some of our services. And then finally, the supply chain. And for me, this is this is quite critical at the minute. Um, NCSC, the National Cybersecurity Centre, would see the supply chain as being one of the biggest risks that we all have at the moment. We are seeing targeted attacks against the supply chain as a means to enter uh, further into an organisation. And whether it be health, whether it be general public sector or private sector, we have we have lots of suppliers across the HSC that connect directly into our systems. They provide support, they provide a managed service, that there's a number of things that they do. But we are seeing attacks on those suppliers as a route into our systems. We do have a very clear process as to how we manage those suppliers. We have protocols around that. Um, and we have a process that if that supplier becomes compromised, how we disable all services until we get assurances back that that supplier is no longer in a compromised position um, and can continue to deliver those services to the HSC. So how do cyber, attack, cyber attacks work? So what I want to do is refer back to an email you have all received over the bank holiday at the end of April, start of May. Um, and this was part of a, a phishing campaign that we completed across the HSC. 
OK, it was an email sent out roughly to about 85,000 email boxes across HSC and it came from Ran R. So the I was left out of, out of R. Um, and what that email did was for what it was to do was to look at to see who would click on the email, whether you would recognize it was a phishing email. Um, and if you clicked on the email, did you then click on the the, the link? and upload your credentials and that's what it asks for it, for it to do. So whenever we think about that in mind and the process of, of clicking on that email, clicking on the link and entering your credentials, whenever we look at how cyber attacks work, generally four stages to it. So, you know, the first stage is the survey, investigating and analyzing information available about the target in order to identify potential vulnerabilities. Okay, so let's send that phishing email in. Let, let's see who, how many people will recognize this as a phishing email or not recognize the phishing email and actually click on it. So the delivery, so it's getting to the point in the system where you have the initial foothold in the system. So emails arrived in your inbox and you've clicked on it. Okay. The breach is exploiting the vulnerability or the front, the vulnerabilities to gain some form of unauthorized access. So one step further, you've clicked on the link and you've put in your credentials. By putting in your credentials, that those credentials have went off to a server somewhere that is held by the bad guys. They now have your logon and password for what that is. And then what they do is they then exploit that. They then take that, log on to the runner and exploit that. And then the effect is carrying out activities within the system to achieve their goal. Okay, and for them, that would be dropping some type of payloads, causing some type of compromise, um, and eventually then, whether it be a ransomware attack or, or locking um, in order to encrypt your systems. So that's a high level overview of how that would generally work through that. Whenever we went through the, the RAN, um, ran our phishing campaign, um, it gives us a baseline of where we are. And Linda, as you mentioned there, the, 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 the cyber awareness training has now started. And on the back of that phishing campaign, it's allow, allow us to see just our, our level of um, training and cyber posture is amongst all of our staff and to target our training then as we move forward in the, a lot of those key areas. So at the, the very last slide, I have a link to some of this material. So this is material from the National Cybersecurity Center, and they have lots of really good infographics um, that can be used, um, can be printed off, can be put up in offices, whatever we want to do with them. But this one just relates back to the last slide, you know, just the, the piece around the survey, the delivery, and different areas where you would we have that, whether it's your, in your network, whether it's malware, whether it's password protection, so forth. The breach and the type of breach and what you need to do in order to um, to protect against that and then the effect that will have. So as I mentioned, they have really good infographics and it touches on, on all areas across cyber. So whether it's password control, whether it's two-factor authentication on your devices, whether it's how you manage your mobile phone, those infographics are there. So there is a, a link on the slide at the end that, that you can um, click on and, and have a look at those further. So we touched on cyber criminals um, and why they do it. Um, and for me, it's all about financial gain. I mean, we just look there, are cyber crimes worth 1.2 trillion. These figures are from last year. Now, I should say, so I'd imagine that's went up um, even from then. Um, and that's what it's worth across across the globe. Um, top cyber criminals now earn, you know, 1.6 million and more and counting. Um, whenever they get ease of access to get to get access to data. Um, there is a demand for cybercrime as a service, uh, believe it or not, and that's, that is gaining um, momentum. That's becoming more and more popular. The dark web is now fully commercialized and, and we, we hear about this all the time. Um, you know, it is like a bit of a, an eBay style. If you're looking for uh, banking details, you can go on and, and, and basically do a search. Um, is proven to be very successful and very profitable for the criminals, for the cyber criminals, um, for selling on the data that they have been able to um, infiltrate from, from organizations. Um, cyber criminals no longer require a deep technical knowledge to launch an attack. No, because a lot of these tools that they use are actually tools or tools that are designed to actually help develop IT, to help develop applications and so forth. And they're actually using them against us. So um, 
we're finding that's happening more and more whenever we look at some of the exploits and some of the, the attacks that we're seeing, um, certainly across across UK or and wider, is I mean using tools that are readily available and can be picked up and used very easily. Um, and any cyber attack now feasible with relatively modest investment. And again, as I say, a lot of these tools are free. You know, it doesn't require um, an awful lot of technical knowledge to use them, um, and it doesn't cost them anything to use them either. So it, it's it's a quick and easy win for the for the cyber criminals. Okay, sorry, I'm just realised of it. Double the slide there. Okay, so just just to highlight, you know. It can all seem very daunting and we know it can seem like that there and there's lots of different things we're doing. But what I want to say is that that is probably one of the key reasons why we have um, why we have kicked off and having continued to manage a cyber program of work across the HSC. So some people may remember back in um, 2017. Actually, the 18th of May 2017, um, when WannaCry hit the UK. Now, WannaCry actually um, hit across the world on the 12th of May 2017, um, starting in Asia and then starting to take out a lot of big industrial areas, um, shipping um, until it hit the NHS on the 18th of May. Um, not targeted, but what it did do was it targeted the vulnerability, the vulnerable machines across the network. Okay, so a lot of older infrastructure and machines that weren't necessarily patched. Um, you can see the figures there. Eighty-one trusts across England uh, were directly impacted by this. Um, that figure is actually higher because what a lot of um, NHS trusts did do was shut down their systems in the event of being. Um, compromised, they took the, they took a proactive action to that. Now, for, for them, that is good in that they weren't they didn't um, their machines were encrypted, and they didn't experience that compromise. But the the business impact and the impact to delivery of healthcare was great in those organisations, as you can imagine. Suddenly, data didn't become available to be able to treat patients. Nearly 600 GPs are affected right across the UK. Um, 11 of the health boards in Scotland. And I mean, the health boards in Scotland deliver healthcare um, through the councils in Scotland. So that, that took out 11 of the big areas. And five trusts in England had to divert um, patients to other um, emergency departments. Again, some of that being because they shut down their systems to prevent um, the, the compromise. So we were very fortunate here um, in HSC that we weren't um compromised by that attack now when i say we're very fortunate we're probably very lucky um from that but this is that was certainly something that was the driver to for the hsc to look at cyber right across the H hsc and say okay how are we going to to manage this um as a region not individually but manage as a region as a region moving forward now I want to just, while I'm here, is just chat very briefly about the HSE incident in, in the south of Ireland in May last year. And I mean, many of you will be aware of, of how um, catastrophic that incident was for the HSE, taking out about 80% of their, um, their systems um, and their desktops. I mean, the, their estate was about 80% encrypted. Um, that incident went on for about 14 weeks um, before they came back um, almost fully functioning. Um, you'll be aware that they they didn't pay the ransom um, and then a decryption key had been provided by the hackers themselves. Um, and even that in itself proved some difficulty to to decrypt some of the, the systems that they had. So it, it doesn't, you know, it, it wasn't a matter of we've got the decryption key, let's decrypt our, our systems and we'll be back up and running. There was actually a lot of work to be done um, in the background on that. Um, the, the impact to healthcare and the delivery of services was magnificent in in, in the sense of right across the, the, the south of Ireland from not just the big cities, but a lot of the smaller areas. And um, they found it very, very difficult. And they did go back to pen and paper. You know, if you were admitted to ED, you were admitted by pen and paper. If you were going into maternity, it was pen and paper. So that was a very, that's a big key learning um, 
outcome for ourselves and ensuring we touched on being ready in the event of a, a cyber attack. Technically, we need to be ready, but, but from a business focus point of view, we also need to be ready to be able to continue to deliver, albeit reduced services, but healthcare services across the HSC in the event of an incident like that. Um, and I mean, there's still there's still a lot of work to be done um, in the south. They have systems back up and working, but and there's a lot of lessons learned. And certainly, we've been working closely with our colleagues in in um, the HSE as to what we can do and what processes we can put in place and what we can learn from that. Um, should and if we are in that um, situation, how we can um, manage our way through it. So. What are we doing? I've already touched on this. You know, what are we doing to help um, to help better our, our cyber posture across the HSC? So we are embedding cybersecurity into our structure and our objectives. Okay, you'll be aware across your organizations that there is cyber leads um, in IT and, and cyber teams have been set up in all of the organizations. Um, when we talk about it being more than just good IT, um, it 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 back to this being everybody's responsibility, cyber should be embedded in everything that we go to do. It's not just an IT, um, an IT job or an IT piece of work. It, it, it occurs across um, all. So if we're looking at, whenever we look at what, what connects to our network, when we look at the type of services that you use, it, it's across all areas across the organizations. Um, integrating cybersecurity into organizations' risks and objectives. Um, and that has been embedded into across all, all of the organizations into their objectives. Um, we have cyber risk on risk registers. We have uh, cyber project groups um, that lead on, on cyber within their organizations. And although this is a, a program of work that will eventually come to an end, we will continue to deliver cyber services across the HSC. We need to because cyber isn't going anywhere and it's only going to require us to stay that step ahead every single time, everything that we go to do. Um, it's a collective response. And that was one of the key elements of the, the program when we stood it up is that we do this, we do this together as a HSC organization. We, we share knowledge, we share um, technologies. We are sharing the HSC network. So what we do, we need to do together. Um, and HSC collaboration, again, it is a program of work across all HSC organizations. Um, all of our trusts, our ambulance service, our fire and rescue service, all of our arms length bodies, our GP services. So anything that is to do with health um, falls under this program. Um, and then one of the key areas, certainly um, for the work that we do and a lot of the project groups that we have is engaging with the experts. So there's lots of information, advice and experts out there that are helping us on our journey um, through the program. You'll notice these slides are both health and from the National Cybersecurity Centre. Um, we have a Northern Ireland Cybersecurity Centre um, and then we also have the National Cybersecurity Centre that we work closely with. Um, Seeking advice, guidance, um, when we're looking at, at tools and technologies, when we're looking to implement policy and process, is that we're doing it to best practice um, for everything that we go to do. We work with other health organizations, um, our colleagues in the, the HSC, but also in um, NHS, NHS Digital, Scotland and Wales. Um, we also work very closely with the wider public sector. So the, the civil service um, here, Department of Finance, and then the wider public sector in England also. So there's a lot of collaboration happening right across um, health and public sector. And then of course, with our, our colleagues um, in health um, in other areas also. We don't want to be reinventing the wheel and everything we want to do. We want to get best practice. We want to know that works and we want to hit the ground one with a lot of the stuff that we're doing. Um, as you appreciate, I'm sure, in, in your own areas, whenever you go to to develop or implement something, you know, that, that could take quite a long time from, from idea to design to going through a procurement and then implementation. So we're, we're trying to um, learn and implement best of breed right across the state. So the HSC program itself um, was kicked off just after WannaCry, um, recognizing that there was a need for the program for us to come together and work together. Um, the program 
is made up of the program board sorry is made up of representation from all organizations um, we have saros we have heads of it we have um uh, internal audit we have representation from department of health so um we, we have a wide ranging um, number of stakeholders on that program board um, and being key stakeholders to what it is that we're trying to um, deliver on here. We have completed numerous audits, um, both internal audits and externally um, external audits across the HSC, across our networks, um, and aligned those to a number of um, frameworks that we are all working towards. Um, from that, there has been key recommendations coming out of that, um, which has formed uh, our our cyber strategy, our HSC cyber strategy, um, which was, was, was officially launched um, last October. Um, of, as a five-year strategy um, to further enhance um, and protect the HSC. One of the main key founding um, foundation blocks for the program was to agree the common approach, common solutions and common technologies. Um, and I mean, across all organizations, organizations are responsible for, for cybersecurity within their organization. But what we wanted to do was to ensure we were doing this in a, cent in a standardized and centralized way, using the same technologies. Um, knowledge sharing, I've already mentioned, we don't reinvent, try not to reinvent the wheel. So we're working together to, to by doing that together, to strengthen our, our security posture across the HSC. Um, we are one um, large HSC network. And that's ensuring that we are mindful of that and we are protecting each organization as we move forward. Um, we did complete a high level gap analysis against ISO 27001, which is the information security standard. Um, and that was completed uh, several years ago. But along with that, we have moved towards Cyber Essentials Plus. Um, we also have the NIS directive, which is very similar to the Cyber Essentials Plus. So all of these standards and all of these frameworks and all of the, the audits that we complete are, are completed against um, standard frameworks. Um, all with similar outcomes that the program board have taken forward and we are addressing through the separate program. So the program itself has had three key work streams and th this may seem quite um, a simplified table. There's quite a lot of um, sub work streams below this um, and key projects that are ongoing. But at a very high level, um, DHC and I commissioned BSO to take forward a, a program for HSC for cybersecurity. As I mentioned, that happened in 2018. The program board was stood up with representation across all um, HSC organizations. Um, and to deliver this program in three key areas, and probably the first one I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on is around the technical infrastructure work stream. And um, whenever we talk about cyber, I'd mentioned it, you know, it isn't just IT's responsibility and it isn't just about the tools and technologies to stop some of this. Um, yes, that does very much play a large part in it, but there's there's only so much tools and technologies can do. There's other things we need to look at. We need to look at our strategy. We need to look at policy. So the policy defines what we can and can't do. Um, and our adherence to that, you know, and if there's a breach in that, what do we do? Because that leaves us open to risk, that as a risk and leaves us open to, to vulnerable um, and compromise. And then the other work stream around communications and culture is some of the stuff we're doing now. You know, the board level training, doing some of this dispatches work, um, our e-learning training, which um, I know some of you have completed already, and even some of the training now that we're kicking off on a monthly basis. Um, the, the staff awareness piece is, is on everybody understanding what their roles and responsibilities are and how they, how they fit into the larger cyber program, the large, larger cyber plan. The, the program is um, timetable that, that sorry, that the cyber strategy runs until 2026 um, with the program run parallel to that in order to develop an, a number of key objectives coming from the strategy. Um, um, at that point in time, then there will be a decision to make as how we move into the delivery of cyber services across the HSC, which, which is happening at the minute and being managed through the program, but that will then move back into two organizations. So the key functions and these, again, I'd mentioned with a lot of um, sub 
uh, substructures below the, the main structure we have there. And this takes forward a lot of the key functions we have. And I'll not touch on everything that we have here. Um, but certainly whenever we look at the cyber strategy and um, policies and standards. So our strategy was released in October 2021. And um, we had also released uh, in June, July time last year, the new ICT security policy across the HSC and the associated standards. So the standard for email, standard for internet, standard for passwords and so forth. They've all been um, de designed and developed by a working group representing all of the organizations. Um, and they have went back to local trusts and organizations for local implementation. So it means we're all adhering to the same policy. We all have the same um, standards um, and processes for working through those. Um, we also talk about um, the our submitting bids and technical plans. So the, the cyber program is is the key area where we, we try to bid for funding for resource and for, for tools and technologies and doing that together as a HSC organization as opposed to each, each individual organization um, and securing funding in order to deliver our, our program of work. Um, and then the final one I'll touch on is setting the, the strategic direction for cybersecurity. So I'd mentioned the cyber strategy has been approved. It has now also been aligned with um, the digital strategy, innovation and data strategy, which I know if Dan was on the call, he, he would maybe have touched on, um, which are due to be released shortly. And the cyber strategy has had a sort of a look and feel change and aligned in with those strategies also. Um, so the digital strategy being the, the overarching um, and delivering on the, the other strategies also. So I think over the next month or two, they're due to be, due to be released. Okay, so what can you do? Okay, so as, as, as staff members, as um, all of us that, that work across the HSE, what can we do? Um, for me, it's being cyber aware, and this relates back to both your personal and your work life. You know, anything that you learn with regards to cyber and the tools and technologies in both your personal life, should, you should be able to reflect it in your work life and vice versa. Um, completing your cyber training. Okay, there's mandatory training that should be completed every two to three years, depending on which organization you're in. Um, but there's also the monthly training that was kicked off um, as of yesterday. You will have all received an email asking you to complete the training. And again, this training is targeted as a uh, monthly training. It should only take um, a few minutes to complete. It may be a video, it may be a slide, but it's to raise awareness around uh, key topics and key areas we're seeing um, of high risk uh, moving forward. So I think the training that was released was around fishing that we had seen, and that was on the back of the fishing campaign that was released at the end of May, highlighting at uh, the end of April, start of May, sorry, highlighting just um, what a fishing uh, email may look like, what to look out for, and what you should and shouldn't click on. Um, strong passwords. And what we do is we, we recommend, and this is NCSC guidance, is that it's three random words. You know, previously it would have been alphanumeric, at least eight characters, one capital, one number, and so forth like that. Um, and what they're saying is strong passwords now are three on three random words that aren't aren't um, connected to each other, for example. Um, it makes it harder for um, for those those passwords to be correct. So it's looking at your passwords, making sure you have strong passwords, that your password isn't set, sitting as at password, password one or password one, two, three, or password 22 or so forth. Um, and implementing passwords on everything that you have. Turning on two-factor authentication. Okay, so whenever you, um, previously when you were working from home, you would have maybe logged onto your laptop. And um, we now have that, uh, that authentication piece done in the background and we do we do some of that for you other areas you can turn on two-factor authentication yourself okay so i've already mentioned the likes of um your bank you would have two-factor authentication they'll require a a password and a pin code that may be sent to you on your mobile phone or so forth um, i've talked about whatsapp another simple one that that, that functionality is there go in and turn it on it asks you then to every every so often to uh, reset your your to um, input your PIN, um, but it's giving you that extra protection, okay? Update your devices. 
Now, within the HSC, we do that for you, you know, in that we push those patches out. Whenever you see that message coming up from Software Centre to say updates are available, click on and do the updates. OK, we're asking you to protect the machines that you're working on to ensure your patches, security patches are all up to date, to ensure your antivirus is up to date. OK, so whenever you see that message, click on that on your own devices, your, your iPhone will send out their software updates available. Do those as quickly as you can. OK, make sure your machines and your devices are always up to date. And then finally, backup of data. OK, that, and that is something that we do. Um, if your data is on the network and you're working from, from a HSC system, that will happen in the background. This, for me, the backup of data is your own personal data. When you look at what you have in your, your, your own devices at home, your photographs, whether you have your own portable hard drives, whether you have USB sticks at home because we can't use them in the office, um, that that data is all backed up. Okay, because if not, and we, we're seeing more and more attacks where not only are they um, encrypting the devices, but they're also encrypting your, your backups as well. And that data is gone forever. So making sure that you back up your data. So that was a very quick whirlwind of cyber in the HSC. And um, there are my contact details um, and email address. If you want any further information or you want to contact me about anything, please feel free. There's also several links there. The first one is the uh, infographics I talked about and the learning material that the NCSC um, provide on their website. The, the website itself is excellent. Um, it, if you can search for anything, it'll, it'll give you advice and guidance on any topics of interest, both technical and non-technical. Um, and there's also a link to the Leadership Centre for um, your e-learning material. So the e-learning course there takes about 30 minutes with a wee test at the end of 10 questions. Um, and as I say, that's mandatory training that should be completed across the, the, the organisation. So any questions? Afternoon, Caroline. Damien Moore here. I'm going to ask you a quick question. Go ahead, Damien. Um, who's responsible for ensuring services have prepared and tested business continuity plans to be used in the event of a successful attack? The organisations they belong to. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. In terms of how, <laughs> how confident are we that the business continuity plans are out there, that they've been prepared and they've been tested? Um. I could not answer that, but certainly I have been doing some work, as have the other cyber leads across the organisations. Um, I know on the back of a number of incidents that we were party to last year and involved in, um, all organisations had reminded all services to update their, their business continuity plans in the event of a cyber attack, because business continuity plans typically would have been if you had a, your system was was down for two days or you, you weren't able to, to access something. But in the event of a cyber incident, and certainly what we see in the HSC, where you're out for 14 weeks, you need to be looking at the longer term impact to the delivery of your services of IT not being available and how, what that longer term impact is going to be. I know from a regional perspective, I sat on some of the with some of the regional system owners um, and looked at business continuity plans and advised from the cyber perspective and what they needed to look at and what they were going to do and what alternatives they could they could put in place. So to me, that that is back to each of the organizations to ensure that that's happening. And I know there has been really good progress has been made to seek assurance. That would be back to the organizations, I think, to do that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it's just holding people to that, you know, is the difficult. I, I, I'm, I'm long enough in to remember Y2K and all the effort that was put into Y2K and the preparation of business continuity plans. And I remember walking the walk less than a year later and uh, people had almost forgotten about them. So yeah. I, I haven't been involved in that space for so long, but I would be a little bit concerned that things maybe aren't as rosy in that garden as we yeah. would hope. Yeah. Um, and I would agree, you know, that there's probably work to be done in all areas there. Um, our focus certainly with within the cyber program is around our incident response Absolutely. and how, te how yeah. technically we would manage should we have a cyber incident. Um, and that's something we have, we've developed a plan about two and a half years ago, building upon that again in light of some of the incidents that we've seen. There's always lessons learned coming out of everything that we're doing um, and ensuring that technically we're ready should we have a, a, an incident. But you're right, the, the business side, you know, and how they would continue to deliver 
a, a healthcare service is key to that. Thank you. No problem. Oh, Linda, you're on mute. Right, I'm going to sorry, stop sharing here. There we go. Dermot has a question for you, Carolyn. Hi, Dermot. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Caroline. Um, I just um um that was very uh, useful sort of um, summary of things, um, and I know you and I have had some conversations in the past, and I'm I'm very conscious of the fact that this isn't you know just uh, just your world, you know it impacts elsewhere, yeah. and as it impacts on our world, we're we're uh, still sort of got a bit of a question over um, you know when we are uh, engaging in outsourcing of services outside. Um, you know, we're are we're getting some feedback about you know the the um, specification of Cyber Essentials Plus, um, and the time that it takes to achieve that level of certification, and the potential for cost of for providers that to likely be passed back. Um, has anything really? I mean, I'm just conscious of being aware of that, but n not being br widely sort of known. Is there any advice being given or or uh, to to people about about the building of time and and costs into their into their contracting. Yeah. So the um sorry, just for everybody. So Dermot's also referring to we have had mentioned about the supplier uh, assurance framework that we have created, and what that does is risk assess um the the procurement or the the, the type of procurement that you're you're looking to purchase um into sort of low, medium, and high, and where it is a, a high risk uh, procurement, which is potentially access to our data and access to our systems, that supplier must have a number of mandatory, um, there's a number of mandatory requirements. So one of them is around having Cyber Essentials Plus um, as, a, as a requirement to, to bid for that work. Um, that framework term, it was signed off by the program board in, I'm trying to think the, the dates now, April, May time, April, mm -hmm. end of April, start of May. Um, and there is a full uh, communication implement, implementation plan in place for that. So we've been working closely with our, our pals in, in our colleagues in, in pals, um, and looking to to speak with and communicate out to suppliers to tell them this is coming. You know, this is what we will be looking for. Now, it isn't necessarily new to suppliers because certainly if they're doing any work in England, Scotland, Wales, they have already implemented the same type of, of framework. Um, and it is also coming in through uh, CPD and the wider public sector and um, the, the similar framework. So that, that will happen. So the the implementation of that working closely with with trust procurement and trust IT procurement. Um, we are trying to address some of the some of the areas that you're concerned about there. Now, with regards to the cost of Cyber Essentials Plus, we have also been working with um, Ismay as a group that actually lead on the the implementation certification for Cyber Essentials Plus. We actually had a call with them this week, um, and they're going to provide advice and guidance to us that we can then send back to the suppliers. So signpost them to where they can get help, where they can get some advice, where they can get um, certification bodies to help them work towards it, and potentially where they can get, and probably crucially, some funding to help towards this also. So that information, as we communicate out to all of our suppliers, we'll be signposting them out to this as well and providing some of that advice and guidance. And what I'll say is, you know, whenever we looked at this initially, it was thought that, you know, we, we need to look initially at IT contracts. But whenever you look at, at across the piece, and Dermot, we're talking probably about the independent sector here, we're talking about um, our maybe estates folk where they're, they're putting in a new heating system there is still a requirement for that system to connect to the network, for the supplier to connect to that system, to connect our network to support that system and so forth. So it touches in all areas across health, not just on an IT an IT um, area. The, the trust local IT um, and cyber leads will also be picking up with local IT procurements, our local procurements also, and provide the same advice and guidance because this framework is HSC wide, it isn't just within, within BSO and for regional contracts. So Dermot, happy enough to pick up that with you off this call as well, just if to see how that's progressed further. Sure. Okay. No Perfect. Worries. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Carl and I have a couple of questions. Yes, go ahead. Not surprisingly. <laughs> Are you at liberty to give us a percentage of the people that clicked on the phishing email? I'm curious. Um, I can tell you across the, and Paul, you might have a more readily than me, across the HSC, the figure was. So Caroline, in terms of the ones who actually opened it and put the details in? He actually inputted 131. The... Yeah, 131 across the HSC. Entered the details into it. Okay. I think it was 1,500 actually went into it, but 7,000 opened it. <clears throat> yeah, so 7,000 opened it. The follow up question is Was Linda McRandall one of them? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if she, she was, yes. She was the first one in. I think it was the first one in. The second one was Caroline. <laughs> Indeed. So, and, and ju just on that, Linda, then. So it only takes one set of credentials. Yeah. So, you know, it only takes one to, to infiltrate into our, our network. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I'm very aware that we're doing more around integrated systems. And again, as Dermot um, talked about, you know, using more external support. Um, What's the feeling? Is it that because we're implementing this as a HSC that we're safer? Or should we, or, or is there a feeling that well, we should still be working in our silos because what we have in our area is the best protection? No, I mean, it, it, for us, it's it's working to, as a HSC, working together um, to build on what we already have in place and to continue to build, build on those controls where we have, um, talk about system or about, about integration systems and integration. We, we don't want to, security was always seen typically as a blocker to things because we were afraid of the risk, afraid of the unknown. And we don't want to be a hindrance to um, innovation and a hindrance to, because everything is moving in, in, into digital. And we don't want to be a hindrance to that. But we also want, need to be, have sight of it, need to be involved right from the start so we can embed security or embed cyber by design. So it means that we can work with you. We can look at it as a whole and make sure that the best possible security controls are in place right from the very start. Okay. Um, and just to pick up on what you had said about the overarching digital strategy, yeah. um, Claire will be here on the 5th of August to speak to that. Perfect. Um, and we'll be doing a lot of socialization over the summer months with various groups and parties, not just within HSC, but externally as well. So you'll be seeing emails probably coming from me. <laughs> about that <laughs> and i believe the cyber strategy is part of that package which it is so quite with it as well yeah yeah it is perfect are there any other questions from any of our 32 participants this afternoon that's good getting off light <laughs> <laughs> thank you carlin i know i for one will be going on to whatsapp this afternoon to put in the two two fa because i don't have it on that it's probably one of the few things that i don't have it on and it's something that i use quite regularly so thank you for that um tip we will be sharing um this uh recording more widely um and don't forget you have contact details there if you or any of your colleagues have any queries please do come back to us and hopefully we'll see some of you on the 5th of August to discuss the HSE digital strategy. Great. Thanks very much, Linda. Thank so you. Thank you, you everybody.